Okay, so uh, good morning. I'm going to be covering today uh, a topic that was um, kind of writ small, as it were, into uh, the Programming with Category Lecture 7, I believe it was, um, which concerns the, the fact that these algebraic data types that we've been discussing uh, exhibit uh, a property that specifically recommends them in terms of their, their flexibility, their power, their extensibility. And uh, specifically, it's the fact that they are functorial. So um, we uh, can use them as a functor, not only to map types to types, objects to objects, as is the province of every functor, but to map morphisms to morphisms in a way that should preserve composition and uh, map identity to identity. And what we're going to see today is that uh, this functoriality property um, comes quite naturally, um, using that word colloquially, out of um, the features of these functors of which we've spoken as kind of the base objects, things like the identity functor and the constant functor. Um, and then uh, it applies as well for the three types of operations which were covered in previous sessions uh, here and in the programming with categories lectures on which these sessions are based, namely products, co-products and exponentials. We'll see how each of those uh, is itself functorial in a way that's rather elegant and pleasing. Uh, as it turns out, when those operators are used to combine any other of these constructions, um, say a product, having a product of co-products, being a product of exponentials, or you know a uh, a value which is essentially the uh, identity functor with a, a constant, um, those are themselves functorial, and this will afford us um, uh, clarity of reasoning, convenience, and allow for automatic derivation of uh, the functorial properties, uh, the derivation, for example, of FMAP uh, for any algebraic data type. So, so that's our plan for today. Uh, and we're going to jump in to uh, the material here. Uh, okay, so we're going to switch to uh, share my screen here. And uh, we'll dive into some slides by which I'm trying to to synthesize this material. Uh, so we've been discussing algebraic data types. Um, and uh, during our last session together, one of the, uh, uh, we had built up an understanding of product, co-product, exponential. And then we saw that even a, a quite complex recursive data type, something like list or stream or others of their ilk, can be expressed themselves as, for example, a co-product of many, many terms that might themselves, for example, in the case of list, be a, a product. One, an A, an A multiplied by A, product of A and A, or pair of A and A, and A, 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 a tuple of three A's, and then a tuple of four A's, all co-product together. Um, now, this is going to presage a lot of work that we're going to see later with, uh, with algebras. But um, here, the point is that uh, when we have, uh, our, when we're using these algebraic data types, we're building them up out of these, these pieces. And I want to discuss each of these pieces and the operators um, uh, that are combining them. So uh, 
we're going to go through each of these in turn uh, that are important building blocks. So in terms of the very basic components, uh, these uh, identity um, functors uh, factor in there. For example, a uh, functor that maps uh, A to A. Um, it may seem trivial, but if we're talking about uh, a lifting uh, associated with uh, a functor, and we have a functor that is itself composite, uh, so it's an algebraic data type of like A plus one, which would be the maybe uh, functor essentially. Um, it just adds a pointed element, uh, nothing, distinguished nothing element to A. Uh, one component of that is the identity functor, just mapping A to A. So if we think about how to move from maybe to maybe, we have to think about how to move from A to A and nothing to nothing, as well as the whole of uh, the whole shebang. Uh, so the identity functor may seem uh, oddly quirk, quirky, but uh, it's actually an important kind of building block. Um, and this just maps uh, each object onto itself and each morphism onto itself. Um, and here we're going from hask to hask. And uh, in the ideal case, we would map from say int to int and float to float, bool to bool, just like you see here with these uh, gray arrows, just illustrating for a, a small subset of the types, types how they're mapped and then how the morphism of their map. Because what makes functors really interesting is that they preserve structure and that structure is characterized by the morphisms. Um, so we're mapping each type onto itself each morphism exactly onto itself, uh, completely transparently mapping it over into this other category. Now, that's the ideal. Um, and in the ideal world, if we had a function f from a to b, uh, then we would lift it to operate on the identity functor. Via the identity functor, we would lift it to go from identity on a to identity on b. And in this ideal world, identity on A would be what? Identity on A would be, anyone want to say it? Giving you a hint. Identity on A is each type is mapped to itself. So, so if you call the identity functor on A, you should get back what? A. A, identity on B is B, the lifting at the function, or actually in general morphism, right? Um, using the identity functor is just the morphism itself. The morphism is mapped onto itself. I just said it in other words. Now the actual implementation here though is, um, uh, is a little bit more uh, cumbersome. Uh, so we don't have the option of just saying int maps to int nicely within the Haskell syntax. So we define, well, uh, we define a, a, um, a type identity uh, and so associated with a type constructor, identity int reflects the identity functor applied to int or identity on bool, uh, the identity functor applied to bool. Uh, and each of these types is mapped over to their identity component. Naturally, this is Hask as well. So each of these types is, is uh, excuse me, each of these types is also down here, the basic types within this Hask category. Uh, but we have this kind of extra labeling layer, which is a little bit awkward. So here, when we have a, morphism from A to B, we lift it, we get something going from identity on A to identity on B. So we lifted int to identity int, bool to identity bool is even to identity applied to, to is even. In other words, the lifting of, of is even goes between identity int and identity bool. 
Um, but essentially, all it does is apply the function to the lifted version of this function. It applies this function to this A to get this B and just tags the identity kind of construct around it. So we get back an identity B. We discussed this in a previous session. This should be by way of, of understanding and you could see it right there. We just have this kind of pesky, pesky labeling with identity. Um, and we just have to wrap it up uh, like that to please the, uh, the compiler. Um, now, another one that was discussed within one of the lectures I recommended to you by Bartosh, uh, although not, I believe, in the MIT course, was the constant functor. Now, the constant functor maps any type A to a fixed type C. This is capital C fix, but this should be lowercase c fix. Okay. Um, so this is not something, this is a, a fixed quantity. Um, it's, it's a specific quantity with respect to the functor. The functor maps any type A into C. And, and any function on A is mapped into a function on C uh, that is specifically the identity uh, identity morphism. So for example, you might map a type into int. Any type goes into int. And conceivably that could be useful. It sounds rather contrived, but it could in fact be useful. For example, maybe the int represents the size of that type. And the size of that type, you know, in terms of number of bytes, perhaps. Uh, and so any type is mapped into some int. So C here would be int. And what any morphism between two types would just be mapped to the identity on on int. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be a particularly interesting function. But conceivably, that yeah, that could be something worth um, you know musing about. So here, every type is mapped onto a single type, and all the morphisms between them, while I haven't shown them, are mapped to the identity morphism shown here in this dotted line in our training wheel kind of uh, example, our training wheel illustration. Uh, so here, if we have uh, a type A and a type B, and we have a function between them, or in general a morphism between them, uh, if, this, if these are just objects, let's suppose this is asked, so we'll say they're types, this is a, a function, and we lift it to go from const c to const c. Now, const c here for both int and say bool, if a is int and b is bool, then uh, that const, they, they're both constant. And uh, this fmap app is in fact just going to be the i the the identity here. So I should really say, and I'm not sure why this didn't get um, didn't get left out or got left out here. Um, it's just identity on ooh, identity on C. So it takes any, for example, here int and turns it into itself. So it maps itself to itself. Um, and this was covered in Bartosh's lecture, if anyone's uh, interested there. But if we have this functor, we could create it like this. Const C is itself a type constructor that takes an A and, and uh, maps any A into, turns out, const C. Um, so this is an instance of a functor because it has an F map. The job of that F map is to lift 
is to perform the lifting. It's to map uh, a function from A to B up to a function from C to C, right? And how does it do it? Well, if we apply, oh, sorry, oh, um, uh, F, this function F from A to B, uh, and we want to apply it to a cont C, we get back the same exact value. So this is where destructuring it using the data constructor here, getting the particular value C, and we're just building a cont C because this C is the same as that one. Um, it doesn't change this identity on C. This is identity here. So this is a perfectly good mapping to lift something like unit in Haskell um, to lift it um, as we, uh, or to map things to it, I should say. Okay, so these were two example functors, identity and const. But now let's talk about these, the, so that showed they're functorial. We have F map for each one of them, great. But when we're dealing with algebraic data types, we have more than those basic elements like constants and identity. We have these constructed elements, these, um, these composite elements, like products and co-products. How does functoriality work for there? Well, to kind of talk about this with some degree of clarity, we have to talk about a topic that it's kind of been in the background, but like so many of those topics, um, both David Spivak and Brennan Fong and, and Bartosz, all of them, uh, they didn't really go into it until needing to encounter it uh, in, in discuss, discussing algebraic data types. And that concerns product categories. So in general, if we have two categories, C and D, we can construct a... So those are two arbitrary categories, and we can construct a product category. And a product category, it's a category, just like the other two. It observes all the rules of categories. Um, but an object in it has a very particular structure. An object in the product category, C cross D, the product of C and D, is a pair of objects. C from C and D from D. And here uh, we have from a given pair of such objects, C and D, to another, so that's that's one object in this in this uh, product category. And there's a morphism from that object to any other object, say C prime, D prime, if and only if there's a morphism from C to C prime and C and D to D prime and D. Uh, and this uh, basically allows us to, to, to think about uh, product categories where we have C and D differently, but I'm gonna focus specifically for our discussion on this case of, of a C cross C which is a, a very specific case. So here's C and here's C cross C. So each of these objects in C cross C is just a pair of two objects in C. Great, so there's an object here for every pair of possible objects here. Terrific, it's a good start. But um, categories are more than objects. We have morphisms and specifically uh, if we take one of these objects here and another one, as I said, there exists a morphism between them, which is itself a pair of morphisms. If and only if the first of the pair of morphisms is a mapping of the source category between the, the first of these two elements of each object and the second one here, only if it's between these two. So there's a map, for example, from A cross A to B cross B because we have F going A to B, both for the first of that pair uh, and the second of a pair. Let's take something like A cross C. 
Okay, so we have an object for that pair of A and C. Um, there's a morphism from that to B cross B. Why is there a morphism from A cross C to B cross B? Can anyone tell me? Why is there that morphism? What is it that allows that morphism to exist? Because in C, over here, we have a uh, morphism F from A to B and G from C to B. That's exactly it. So if you think, okay, you just look at the first element here, A and B. There's a morphism from A to B, which is F. Ah. And then C to B. Is there one over here? Yeah, G. So F cross G has to be here. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, by the same token, A cross C, the pair of A and C has a morphism going to B and D because there's a morphism from A to B, that's F. So this F is cut up for the first of these pairs. And then from C to D, that's H. There we go. So there's a morphism for each of those. But there needs to be a morphism for each, uh, for example, um, uh, I'm trying to, you know, construct the example here. But imagine, uh, imagine that we have a B cross C. And there it is. Okay, B cross C. Um, and uh, there should be a morphism here. You might think there should be a morphism. You might think there should be a morphism from B cross C. Um, uh, to, for example, B cross D. After all, there's one from B to B. Um, and uh, and then uh, from, from C to D, there, there should be one, right? Um, so in fact, B cross C and, and then uh, should, there should be a morphism to B cross D, but that's not, in fact, shown because I was not careful enough. Um, but I'm trying to create a, a counterexample here. Um, okay, so uh, clearly there's uh, there's no morphism from uh, B cross C, for example, to uh, A cross D. Why? Because, well, you tell me. I'm, I'm claiming there's no morphism from B cross C to A cross D. Why is that? No morphism from B cross C to A cross D. Does no, no morphism exists from B to A? Exactly. There is one from C to D, but that ain't enough. There needs to be one for both and there's no morphism going from B to A. So that one, they wouldn't be connected here. Um, this is a product category. Objects are pairs and the morphisms are, are just pairs of morphisms mapping between the elements of the pairs associated with the objects. Um, now, um, it turns out that once, once you have this product header, it's kind of an a, a unwieldy beast, or it's kind of a, you know, bit of a thing to have to talk about. But um, it allows us to define bifunctors. And these are going to be important for the definition of these operators that combine things like co-product and, and product, OK? Um, pairs and tuples product. So a bifunctor uh, is a functor from, from a product category to, to another, another category here. Uh, and uh, it maps pairs of objects into a single object in the destination category and pairs of morphisms into a single morphism in the, uh, the category. And we're gonna focus on these bifunctors 
from this category here, okay? Um, we're just gonna map from C to C into C. Oh man. Um, so it's gonna go from this category, this product category we were just discussing over to here. So like C cross B is mapped to whatever the bifunctor says it's mapped to. C tensor B, the tensor is just, it's not tensor calculus. It's not tensor, tensors as in linear algebra sense. It's a different sort of sense of tensor. It's just some combination of these. This is basically a way of combining, it's kind of like an operator on C and B. This is just pairs, right? Of B and C. And this says what it's mapped to, that pair is mapped to this. So maybe it's a pair of one and two was mapped to three. Or maybe a pair of one and two is mapped to two, and a pair of two and three is mapped to, on one case to five, but for another bifunctor might map it to six because one is doing multiplication and one is is doing uh, addition. In any case, these can be represented as bifunctors. We kind of need this ungainly thing to be able to combine objects um, using these bifunctors. Um, okay, so we have these these bifunctors. And the point is that it, it maps pairs of morphisms and pairs of objects uh, into this category here. And it turns out that's what we need for things like co-product and product. We have a product of two things. We want to be able to talk about those as kind of objects in some category. And we want to be able to reason in terms of a functor, how that's mapped to another another category, we'll talk about these bifunctors. Okay, now all of that was to sort of provide a little bit of foundation for what we're going to see now, which is a, a very practical side of all of this involving the functoriality of products and co-products, um, meaning they can be F-mapped. You can have functions lifted to apply to them. And you say, well, wait, wait a minute, there's two things in here. How can we lift a function? Well, we have two functions because we're dealing with a bifunctor. We're dealing with two functions and two objects. This is like the pair of A and C. Mm. And this is like the pair of B and D. Mm. Um, and we're going to be able to have a mapping between them. Um, and our bifunctor, which is going to map from here to, to C itself, is going to be defined for pairs of objects. We're going to lift, excuse me, pairs of morphisms, not just one morphism. Like if we have a functor like the list functor, we give it one single function, boom and it will map it over all the elements of that list, right? Single function. Here, for a pair, we give it two functions. One, which operates at the first element, and one, which operates on the second element. So uh, with a list functor, we might, you know, if it's a list of A, we might give it a function that maps from A to A prime. And so lifting it, so operate a list of A will give us a list of what? We have a function from A to A prime and we lift it to operate a list. It'll map a list of A into a list of what? Speak use. We have a, if we have a function from A to A prime and we lift it to operate on lists, it's going to map a list of A into a list of what? Uh, A prime. A prime. Good. Yes. So here we're going to have two functions, R and S. And we're going to lift them to map from a pair of AB to a pair of A prime, B prime, because these first of these functions goes from A to A prime. Second of the functions S goes from B to B prime. We're gonna lift them 
to go from a pair AB to a pair A prime B prime. Hmm, that's the idea. And this all has to do with these, because these are pairs, because these are pairs of functions, we can represent them in the product category. This, that's how we kind of formalize this, but don't worry about it too much. The point is we can operate on these pairs and it's a genuine functor. This is a functor. This is a good, honest, and honest to goodness functor here. Maps objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms. So don't think, oh, we're dealing with something. It's not a functor. It's a functor. It's just a functor from a product category. It's nothing terribly special about it. We give it the name by functor, but it's a functor. Uh, it's a functor just as sweet. Uh, Okay, so here we go. Here we have products. Okay, so you may recognize this. Anyone recognize this diagram? Um, does anyone anyone remember what uh, I probably should have shown a picture uh, so you could have seen it of what um, products and co-products look like? Let's let's go back and just take a trip down memory lane. Um, Remember uh, products and co-products, this is what a product look like, right? We have uh, in a product, we have this object C, I'll, I guess I should put it up here. Uh, sorry, we have this, this object that, that we speak of informally as the product object, but what distinguishes it is this pattern. Um, there's a projection down from it to A, and a projection down to it to B. Each of these components is a projection down. You can think of them as first and second in Haskell. It extracts the first component and extracts the second component. And it has this universal property that for any other object that, that is in this pattern, that is it has these kind of um, mappings down to these, there exists a unique morphism. That's, that's the, the features of a product, it was this pattern, it's kind of kidney shaped pattern or Star Trek pattern or whatever you want to think of it as, maybe it's appropriate uh, today. Um, and this, these triangles have to commute. That's, that was the pattern associated with the universal construction um, for products. So just remember that pattern. And now we'll go back to this guy. Do you recognize that pattern? Wait, ain't that the same pattern? Yeah, it's the same pattern. Um, C here, so here's A cross B, it'll be pair A prime B prime. And what's the, what is it that stands in for C in this, this one here? What is it that C? Oh, it's pair A B. Well, look, pair, this is a pair, this is a product. And by the definition of a product, any other object in the category must have that has these these maps here down to A and B has to have this unique morphism from it down to uh, this this product. So this has to have this unique morphism down to this because this is a genuine product. And this unique morphism is this by map. It's this lifting of R and S to map from a pair AB to a pair A prime B prime. So just as lifting a single function from A to B to a list of A maps it to a list of B. Um, so it is that lifting RNS here uh, allows us to map from a pair a, a B to a pair A prime B prime because R goes from A to A prime and B goes from B to B prime. That's the idea. Here, yeah. we, we were given these two functions or in general morphisms and we lift now pair with them. And this should look familiar because this is, this is that same sort of construction uh, that we, we were dealing with here. We have a little bit more texture because this pair by virtue of being a pair it too is associated with this general feature and it has these projection maps. Remember, it's a bit of a misnomer to call this the 
the product. It, this is maybe we call it informally the product all, uh, object, but the whole thing is the product. It's this pattern. And so this is a product pattern. This pair has a first operation, which extracts A. This pair has a second operation, which extracts B. And R maps from, from A to A prime, and B, S maps from B to B prime. And as a result, we get a pair of A prime, a pair, a pair of A prime, B prime. That's what we, we get out. Um, so the fact that this is a pair provides this, and we simply map these, and uh, this, this is a product. So any other object, including pair AB, has a unique map. And this is the bimap. This is the equivalent of, of our mapping from pair AB to pair A prime B prime, just like it's the lifting of R and S to go from pair AB to pair A prime B prime. Okay. Um, and it's guaranteed to uniquely exist because of the producthood. The, 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 the universal property of products. Great. This is, so, so this is how we lift pairs of morphisms to operate on products. Okay. Um, and there's a bit of fanciness because we deal with this product category, but it, it ain't anything too fancy, um, in fact. This is just a product pattern. We've kind of taken advantage of it here. Okay, um, now let's look at coproducts. Coproducts is very similar. And you may remember coproducts, what they looked like. This is coproducts. Coproducts, well, products have these projection maps. Coproducts has these injection maps or insertion maps. Um, instead of these arrows coming down from C to MB, they kind of had these insertion maps, as it were, or would be insertion maps into C. And what distinguished a coproduct was there was a unique map out from it to any other object that was associated with these insertion maps. This was kind of the mediating one, the closest one, the privileged one, the, the best one, the perfect one, the exemplar one. And it factorized anything else. Anything else that had these kind of properties, it goes through this. Just like on the reverse direction, product is on its way from any other object. This might be a tuple. And we can, we can get A and B out of a tuple and toss away the third element. But it's more efficient. It's more beautiful. It's more perfect. It's more of an exemplar to do it out of a pair. And any tuple can be implemented with a pair. That's what this is saying. And similarly, you know, any um, any other pretender to be something like this that keeps track of whether it's from A or B can be implemented like this. Uh, okay, that was the idea with coproducts. And here we have coproducts. So. If we have a coproduct of either A, B, we have this. We have these injection maps, these insertion maps into this from A and B. Uh, but we can also have a morphism S that maps B to B prime, and a morphism R that maps A to A prime. And we can lift an either A, B, Oh, sorry, we can lift R and S to map from either A, B to either A prime, B prime in this sort of way. All we do is we, we take R and we, and that gives us applying to A, gives us A prime. And all we do then is inject it into either A prime, uh, B prime. And similarly, using S, the thing given to us to lift, all we do is we can map a B to a B prime and all we do is inject that into either A prime, B prime. So given these functions, R and S, we can use them, we can lift either A, B to be an either A prime, B prime in this transparent way. Either A, B is associated with an A and B like this. We map A with R and inject, and we map B with S 
and inject, and we get an either A prime, B prime. And uh, because either A prime, B prime has this universal property that any other object with these ejection maps has a unique morphism to it, there's this unique morphism, which maps from this to this. So all of this is showing, that, gosh, there's this, lifting that goes on here, just as surely as we can lift a function from A to B to map, uh, or from A to A prime to map a list of A to a list of A prime. So we can lift uh, a product um, using two maps, R and S, to go from, uh, excuse me, uh, a, product of a, a product of A B to be a product of A prime B prime or a either a B to be an either a prime B prime. And so this is functorial. It's, it exhibits nice functor properties. Um, the final thing I'll say, and then I'll uh, open it up here to a uh, question, is, is we can do the same with our final construction. So we have products, co-products and the final thing, which we need to kind of complete our, our operators is in fact the exponential object. And we can deal with that as the reader functor mapping like this. Um, so we lift uh, F from a B to map from a, a to E, a function from, sorry, E to A, um, to be a function from E to B. Basically, it's, it's a very simple post composition. So we just, if we need an E to B, we just run this E to A, and then we, then we run F on it, map it to B, and we got our B. Um, and we saw that before. Um, and there's something that I guess I'll call it a co-reader. It's using the term writer before, which I think has been, I've seen used with it, but Alex pointed out that's, that may not be correct because writer is used in a different context uh, as well. So I call it co-reader. I, I don't know what to call it. Um, probably some good name for it. And basically this is kind of the opposite of reader in the sense that instead of being parameterized in its second argument is parameterized in its first. Um, so for example, int is mapped into int, uh, a function from int to v and float is mapped from float to v. And in general, any type a is mapped from to a function from a to some, to some value. And this one you may remember requires this COVID, this contravariance. So this one needs an A to do its job. Um, and that's what we're given. And if so, we can get a B. And we want to return something that needs a B to get it to do its job. Well, we have something that just needs an A to do, to give me a B. So if I have a B, I need a way of converting a B to an A, and then I can use this. And that's what this function is. It needs to go from B to A. We're going to be talking about this a lot, very centrally during our next class. So the co-reader functor um, has this contravariant property that will be the focus of Friday's discussion. And uh, instead of going from A to B, it'll go from B to A um, here. Uh, and instead of... Uh, Post-composing with F instead of calling F after it, after uh, this thing uh, is run to get back us a B, we'll actually call F before uh, to convert the B to an A, which is what this needs to do its job to get back a B, and then we're done. Um, and this is a contravariant functor. We want to provide one of these. All we've got is one of these, so we. We need to get there and use it, and then we can get our, our results. Okay, so um, what we've 
just seen here is that the, the three major operators, product, co-product, and exponential, basically support lifting. And by virtue of being lifting, we call them functorial. They, they, they exhibit these features of being a genuine functor, mapping not only types to types, but, but functions to functions, um, and in general, morphisms to morphisms. And it turns out that anything you build up with them, therefore inherits this nice property. So you can build up components out of these, such as this list functor, this recursive functor, being built up out of co-products of products. Uh, and this is a constant functor, nil, that is a distinguished value. Um, and this is guaranteed to be functorial because these other components are. And in general, if this was fun for me to do about midnight last night, uh, which was um, to, I had to, um, I want to demonstrate that, look, if you have a recursive use of this, let's suppose you have a pair of an either a, b, and a c, for example. So, so now we have kind of combinations of these at multiple levels where we have operators applied to operators. Um, as you might expect, um, this overall operator is associated with a mapping from pair of either A, B, and C to a pair of either A prime, B prime, and B prime with C prime. Um, but this component here uh, itself is a, is a um, combination. It's in either a B, and there's a mapping from that to either, uh, either a prime B prime. Um, so there's a lifting of that that occurs here. So in short, when we have these things that are kind of composed out of multiple levels, combining with products of co-products, et cetera, or co-products of products, um, we we just can map them in this transparent way with with um, by lifting them, um, where we lift the entirety by virtue of lifting each of the pieces. So we can get the ability to lift, for example, a list functor. Uh, we get the ability for it to lift functions by virtue of being able to lift. Uh, the product or the co-products here and lift the things that are being co-producted, these various things. Uh, so we sort of lift, lift those, lift those, and we have a lifting of the entire thing that results. Uh, so here it's we basically have lifting that can go on throughout this entire structure. And because of that, for the entire structure, there's a way of lifting it. In short, anything that is built up of, out of abstract data types can be lifted. The irreducible elements like identity and constant functor, like this one here is the identity functor. This one's a, sorry, identity functor, constant functor. The nil is a constant functor, A is identity functor. And then the basic operations like product, co-product and exponential, they can be lifted. So these products here can be lifted. Um, in other words, they're functorial. And then the compositions of them, like these co-products of these products can be lifted straightforwardly. That's what this was all about uh, as an example. Uh, and as a result, even the most complex data types that can be built up out of here can be lifted transparently, automatically, automatically. They can be just be lifted. Um, we can define what it means to lift them. We, we can derive their functoriality properties automatically because they're built out of these components where we know how to do it. And so abstract data types, therefore not only provide us with this kind of nice orthogonal, convenient, flexible, general, and natural way of combining types, one that supports clarity of reasoning and flexible 
combination, but, but also automatic functor definition. You can automatically derive functors. And in Haskell, in fact, uh, there is this way of saying, you know, you could say deriving functor for algebraic data types. And it will, in fact, derive FMAP for you out of any algebraic data type. So algebraic data types provide us this way of building things up. And, you know, things we see in other languages like record types or, or you know, structs where we name the things, they're basically can be implemented as this. They, they just have some nice syntactic sugar, some nice ways of, of referring to things, but they, they can be implemented in this sort of way. So in short, abstract data types are functorial. We can derive the, the lifting automatically out of these building blocks. And then we can build to our heart's content with uh, the functorial properties of them being derived automatically. So those are all my comments here for today. And I'd like to open it up to some questions here that people would like to ask in the closing minutes. Uh, could you go back to your co-product uh, diagram? This one here, I think. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so one. H yeah. there, is that by map as well? It is. It is a by map. Yeah. It's, it, um, I, I, I didn't label these consistently, and I realized this. Um, uh, I should have labeled it by map. By map is used whenever you're going to have a, uh, a, a mapping from a product category like this, Hask cross, Hask cross Hask into Hask, you could use BiMap to map it. Um, and BiMap for pair does this. It, it'll map a pair AB into a pair A prime B prime because BiMap takes these two functions. We could define BiMap for either to go from an either AB to an either A prime B prime. Um, and it again will take an R and an S going from A to A prime and B to B prime. And this is by map RS as well. And I probably should label it as such. I labeled it H because it also serves this role. And I just kind of left it in there. I mean, it's the unique morphism. It's a unique morphism, hence it's dotted. But yeah, I should have called it a uh, by map. I think that would have been clearer. Good. Great. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Other points for discussion? Not, uh, not seeing anything, anything, just one thing, at a, a prime. Oh, okay. Uh, Alex, maybe you could tell me what slide that was for when you get a chance. Nothing urgent. I, I think she was answering the overhead question oh, okay. number like 10 minutes ago or something. Oh, got it. Okay, okay, uh, okay. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, belated thanks for that answer. So next time I thought we would do well to talk about covariance because it's, it's one of these things that can be hard to get your mind around. Uh, it'll keep, up, keep on cropping up again and again. And unless you have some understanding for it, it'll seem kind of mysterious and ad hoc probably. But it turns out that there's really good intuitions for it. Um, uh, it turns out that we use contravariant reasoning all the time in our daily life. 
Um, and it's interesting because we intuitively know when to apply it and when not to apply it in the real world. And I've tried to draw it, create some examples that illustrate just how frequently we use it. Um, at the same time, we, we apply covariate reasoning in other cases. And, and hopefully by tapping into some of those day-to-day -day intuitions, you'll, you'll learn to recognize, oh, this is, if that's, that's all it is, you know, it's, it's just uh, that sort of reasoning. Um, so uh, we're gonna see that it, it's one of these things that um, ends up playing a, a role on an ongoing background that's kind of ongoing way that's kind of supporting. It's, it, it never becomes like a major problem or issue. And it's, um, uh, but at the same time, there's certain rules for it that are very good to know. Um, and so we talk about things being in the negative position or positive position at mapping. Um, and, you know, it will play a, um, play a role in understanding pro uh, and I think when we discuss dynamical systems through a polynomial functor lens, it'll come up some there. Okay, um, so uh, that's all for today. Uh, I don't think I'll have you watch another video for Friday, but if I could find a really good one on on covariate contravariates, I might, I might uh, ask you to do that. I, I don't have something in mind right now for that purpose. Okay, um, so I will look forward to seeing you on Friday for that discussion. Thanks very much.